today, we have the honor of having Dr. Bart Ehrman, a uh, distinguished professor at the University of North Carolina. Uh, I've had a chance to actually meet him a couple of times. I was a Div student at uh, Duke across the way, and he came over and gave us a lecture in the late 90s. And I found out what textual criticism was. Um, and actually, about 10 years later, I was teaching a New Testament course, and I shamelessly cribbed my notes from his textbook. So I really owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Um, he is one of the leading experts on the Jesus movement and the early church. I think you'll have a great time. Uh, the old folks like myself and my students who start Christianity next week will be really happy to have this lecture in. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bart Ehrman. Well, thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> How are we doing? Good. So uh, my main question is for the students. How much extra credit did he have to give you? <laughs> it's, it's like Saturday morning, really? <laughs> okay, congratulations. You look awake. Stay that way. Uh, okay, well, it's a pleasure to be with you. I was, uh, I don't know what year it was that I was here uh, last. We weren't here. We were the other place, but uh, I remember having a great time. So I'm doing a book on the afterlife, uh, which is uh, the, 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 uh, the issue there is that in America today, uh, the vast majority of people believe in a literal heaven. As it turns out, 72% of uh, people believe in a literal heaven. And a majority, 58% believe in a literal hell. Uh, you die and your soul goes to heaven or hell. Uh, it's what most people think. And the, the theme of this book is that that's not what the Old Testament says. The Old Testament doesn't teach about heaven and hell, and it's not what Jesus thought. So where did it come from? Ah, that's an interesting idea. So, uh, so that's, that's what the current book is. Uh, but the, uh, every time I, I come up with a book idea, it's like I try to figure out something that I think is really interesting. Uh, it may not be interesting to other people, but it's like it's really interesting to me. And uh, that's, uh, that's what's going on uh, with, with this book. This is the, the book, the previous book uh, that I wrote that I just got really fascinated by. And this particular book, The Triumph of Christianity, is a book that is dealing with, for me, one of the most important historical questions in the history of the known universe, uh, which is how Christianity took over the world. How did it happen? And uh, I, I wanted to write this book for years, but I kept thinking it's too complicated. It's too much. I mean, it, it's, it's, and so I worked on it, worked on it. Worked. Finally, I got around. I said, look, I got to write the book. And so I wrote the book. And uh, so it's called The Triumph of Christianity. It just came out a year or so ago. Uh, so let me explain both what that book is about and what I'm going to be talking to you about over the course of these uh, three lectures. And so a few uh, introductory comments. I don't think there can be any doubt that Christianity is the most significant uh, movement in the history of Western civilization, period. Uh, I mean, how, what, what institution is more important for the history of the West? Starting in about the 4th or 5th century, Christianity became the dominant re religion of the Roman Empire. It became the religion of the West throughout the Middle Ages, down to the modern age, down through the, the Reformation and the Enlightenment, and down into today. Uh, and so culturally, it's massive. Culturally, it's massive. Uh, just think about uh, literature. I mean, without Christianity, there's no Chaucer or Milton or Shakespeare. I mean, there'll be other authors, obviously, but they're not, we aren't going to have those people. Uh, music. You wouldn't know Bach or Mozart or Beethoven or, uh, uh, or art. Uh, I mean, just think about the history of art. I mean, go to any museum, medieval art, re Renaissance art. And so, you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo, et cetera, et cetera. And so culturally, it's massive and continues to be a huge influence on us, whether we are Christian or not. And not just that, but also uh, 
politically, economically, socially, every just in in every way as as we continue to see. I mean, to uh, in our current in our current climax climax <laughs> here at the end of the age uh, here uh, here in our in our in our, the current moment, there are people who think that. Um, that the way things are going is very good from a Christian point of view uh, in this country. There are other people who think that it's a, it's a huge disaster from a Christian point. But the reality is a lot of the politics is being driven by, by Christian views, whether we're Christian or not. And so uh, anyway, I think, I think Christianity is hugely important whether you're a Christian or not. My interest is where it came from. Uh, and the reason I'm interested in this is because as a New Testament scholar, I, I know full well. I mean, in, in some sense, it starts with Jesus. But Jesus, uh, Jesus died, and if Jesus had just died and that was the end of the story, then we wouldn't have Christianity. After his death, there were a group of people who believed he got raised from the dead. And that's the beginning of Christianity, when people started believing that Jesus got raised from the dead, because Christianity is about the death and resurrection of Jesus. According to the New Testament, Jesus had 11 remaining followers at the time, uh, 11 men, disciples, Judas having killed himself, and uh, a handful of women who were following him in Jerusalem. So let's say 20 people. I don't know if that's right, but it's got to be something like that. The first, the very first people to think that Jesus was raised from the dead, it started Christianity. So let's say 20 people. These are, all of them, lower class, illiterate, uneducated, rural folk from a backwoods part of the empire uh, who, uh, that's what we started with. Okay? Three centuries later, there are millions of Christians in the world. My calculation I'm going to give later uh, is that probably within 300 years, there are 3 million believers, 3 million people who believe in Christianity. Uh, that's a lot. The Roman emperor, Constantine, converts to Christianity in the 4th century. And eventually then, the Roman Empire converts. How does that happen? By the end of the fourth Christian century, so 400 years later, half of the Roman Empire is Christian. 30 million people. How do you get from 20 people to 30 million people? How does that happen? Is it a miracle? Uh, many people would say, well, it's got to be a miracle. How else would it happen? Now, I respect people who have that point of view who say that God must have done it, although I do have some problems with it. One problem is, if God did it, why did it take 400 years? And another problem is that why was the job never finished? Most of the people in the world are not Christian. So if God was doing it, you'd expect it would have like happened. So there might be other explanations. And what I want to look at in this these lectures is not whether God did it or not. I mean, that's, I'm not going to be talking about, as a theologian, I'm not going to be talking about God. I'm going to be talking as a historian. What can we say about what happened historically for this to happen? Can we make sense of it as a historical movement? Whatever you think personally, theologically, religiously about God's involvement in the process, what was the process? That's what I'm interested in. Uh, and so by the end of the fourth century, 30 million people. Right. So, those are, so that, that's what I want to deal with in these lectures. Is, is how did it, how did it happen? Uh, the vast majority of people, of course, who come to believe in Jesus are people who were, uh, they were not Christian, and most of them were not Jewish. At this time in the Roman Empire, the first century of the Common Era, when Jesus lived in the first century, maybe five or seven percent of the Roman Empire was Jewish. Maybe five to seven percent. Everyone else was what scholars call pagan. Virtually everybody who converted to Christianity in these 300 years had been pagan. And so in this lecture, I'm going to talk about what does it mean to be a pagan 
in the Roman world. And I'm going to define terms and start at the beginning and try and figure out why, what it is that would convince somebody who was of a different religious persuasion to adopt Christianity. Okay? So that's what this is about. So pagan converts and the power of God. Let me begin with my terms. Christian. Uh, I'm using the term Christian in a very broad sense. Uh, just to refer to anybody who worships the God of Jesus and thinks that in some way Jesus is the Son of God who's brought salvation. A okay, very broad sense. Now, where, uh, where we all live in the South, Christianity is usually defined in a very narrow sense as if you don't go to my church, you're not a Christian, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I, I, don't have, I don't have that definition in mind, uh, and that you've got to agree to this, 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 and that. If you don't believe in this, 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 you're not really a Christian. You may say you're a Christian, but you're not. So I'm, I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying someone who, who, think, who worships the God, only the God of Jesus or just worships the God of Jesus and thinks Jesus is the Son of God and Savior, by that definition, that's, that's just kind of the broad definition I'm using. We could talk about that if you want to. The word pagan is even more problematic because for most people it has negative connotations. Uh, and so I need to say right up front that when I say the word pagan, I'm not using it in the same way I use it when I say that my next door neighbor is a real pagan. Which, by the way, he is. <laughs> <laughs> But well, we're not going to go there. Uh, so uh, the word pagan, when used by historians, does not mean anything negative or derogatory. It simply refers to anybody who is a polytheist who practices uh, ancient religions. They worship many gods, and so it means they're not Jewish and they're not Christian. Jews and Christians worship only one god. Everyone else in the Roman Empire, the other 93 or 95 percent, worshiped many gods. Uh, and so we're, we've got to call them something. And for historical reasons, scholars have come to call these, these people pagans without meaning anything negative about it. Just they're, they're, they follow these polytheistic traditional religions I'm going to describe in a minute. Uh, scholars often talk about paganism. Uh, and in my book, I talk about why that's somewhat problematic. Because these various pagan religions were different from one another wildly different from one another. There were certain characteristics in common, and so scholars talk about this as a phenomenon, paganism, but there's really some question about whether it's really an ism or not, because we're talking about thousands of religions, and we're grouping them all together and saying that it's a thing. And in the ancient world, nobody thought that they were like a pagan. Nobody ever thought that, like, I'm participating in a thing. They were just doing what everybody had always done for thousands of years. This is, you know, this is how they practice part of their relationship to the gods. And so, so it's not quite clear there's a thing called paganism, but it, it's not going to matter much what I'm going to do. Uh, so uh, the way I want to get to what it is that paganism was about, what pagans were up to, is I want to uh, think a little bit uh, with you about why people are religious today uh, as a way of setting up what the differences are with ancient religions. And so why, why are, so you, you have your own list of things for why you think people are religious today. I'll just give you a list of some of the things that occur to me. Uh, some people are religious uh, or participate in religious, uh, in, in churches or synagogues or uh, their private spirituality as a kind of quest for truth. Uh, they, they, they want to deal with the big questions in life. Why are we here? Uh, what is the meaning of life? How are we to understand our world? Uh, and we want to know because we are human beings and we have a quest for knowledge. And so there's this search for truth and religion provides answers that we can't get from other realms. You get answers by, uh, by uh, studying literature or by looking at history or by engaging in the sciences. You get all sorts of answers for truth, but religious truth is, is one area that people are religious in order to, to find answers to ultimate questions. Religion, for many people, provides a moral compass. It, it gives you direction for how to live your life. 
for uh, for many of my students, if it weren't for religion, it would be it wouldn't be a frat party every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. It'd be a frat party seven nights a week, and days of the week, and like there'd be no reason to behave because if there's no religion, and so religion for many people gives them the kind of boundaries they need for uh, for for their morality, for knowing how how to live and how to behave in the world. Religion for many people uh, involves fellowship and community. Uh, one very important reason for people going to synagogue or church is because they periodically get together with people who are like-minded to talk about the big issues and to share concerns and to support one another and to uh, provide actual help for one another. And, and so it's, it's a community, uh, that, a, a religious community, where there will be lots of differences but also lots of commonalities, and that people find that extremely helpful. And for many people... The reason for being religious is because of the life to come, uh, the afterlife. My, uh, I'd say my students at Chapel Hill, the ones that are highly religious, it's principally because of this, uh, because the, the afterlife. They, they, don't want to, uh, they don't want to roast in hell, and they want to have the glories of heaven. And you get that by having the right religion. Uh, and I think probably the fear drives people more, or at least young people, the fear drives people more than the hope. Uh, for my students, uh, my very strong sense is that, uh, that their, uh, their Christian faith is a kind of fire insurance. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> they want to be protected and because it could be, it could be bad later. And so, that, all right, so go, you, you have some other reasons. I have other reasons too for why people... But, this is good for, for just to get us thinking about it. Why were people religious in antiquity? None of the above. This seems really weird, but it's really true. Uh, religion had nothing to do with those four points. First, the idea of truth. Ancient religions did not have doctrines. Ancient Roman Greek religions, religions anywhere else in the world, there were not doctrines that you had to subscribe to. As in Christianity, there's one God, Christ is his son, he died for the sins of the world, he raised from the dead, you have all these doctrines. Roman religions didn't have doctrines. Okay? Ah, uh, they had virtually no religious ethics. Now, people have this idea that in the ancient world, pagans were basically immoral because they didn't have Christianity yet or they didn't have the Ten Commandments, and that's absolutely not true. Uh, people in the ancient world were just as moral as people are today, maybe, um, or just as immoral, but they were, they're basically like people are today. But the grounds for the morality had nothing to do with their worship of the gods. That seems weird to us. But as we're going to see, in the ancient world, the gods didn't care how a person lived for the most part. The gods wanted to be worshipped, as we'll see. Uh, they, so what you did in your personal life is your problem. Uh, but the gods are there to be worshipped, not, not to give you rules for how to live. There's virtually no community in the ancient world, uh, religious communities. Uh, if you were a worshiper of Zeus, the Greek head god, uh, there, were, there wasn't like a church you would go to once a week and talk about Zeus and tell stories about Zeus and pray to Zeus and share your concerns and hope Zeus would help all of you. There, there, there weren't, weren't weekly meetings at all. There, there, were, there were periodic uh, times where you get together and engage in ritual acts towards Zeus. But there's no community, no fellowship. And there's virtually no religious connection to the afterlife. Virtually no religious connection uh, to the afterlife. Religions were not about securing what happens when you die. Most people in the Roman world appear not to even have uh, thought there was an afterlife. Uh, no afterlife. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, interesting tombstone inscriptions you get in ancient Rome it's kind of, it's, it's comparable to what we have today where you, you go to a cemetery, you might have R.I.P. on a tombstone, rest in peace, right, R.I.P. And you just put R.I.P. because everybody knows what it means. In the, in the Roman world, there was a different, uh, a different set of abbreviations that was uh, seven letters instead of three. The seven letters were uh, uh, N.F.F. 
N-S-N-C in Latin. It stood for non fui, uh, fui, non sum, non curo, which means I was not, I was. I am not, I care not. <laughs> so I didn't exist before, then I did exist, now I don't exist, and you know, it doesn't matter to me because I'm dead. <laughs> I don't have any thoughts or any feelings or anything, I'm dead. And so that was like a very common. And so religion was not a way of securing the afterlife. So if, if well, the reason people are religious today isn't the reason people were religious back then, why were they religious? I mean, why? <laughs> If not those things, why, why would you possibly even bother? Uh, and in fact, uh, well, uh, they, they bothered for good reasons. And so here's a couple things that we could say about what religion was in the ancient world. First, as I've indicated, in traditional religions, in Rome, in Greece, everywhere else, uh, religions were polytheistic. They believed in many gods, not just one god. Everybody in the ancient world knew that there were lots of gods. There were gods of various functions, and there were gods of various places. Uh, so every, everything that we are involved with had gods who were in control. So uh, the weather, gods of weather, the crops, the livestock, health, war, childbearing, you, you know, anything that we are involved with, there was a god or gods or goddesses uh, connected with it who could provide us with what we needed. And there were gods of every place. Every city had its gods. Every town, every village had its gods. Every home had its personal gods. There were, uh, there were gods of, the for of a forest and of a meadow, of a river, of a mountain. Gods lived in different places. And, there, and everybody knew there were lots of gods of lots of places and lots of functions, thousands of gods. Not just the gods of Greek mythology or Roman mythology, you know, not just Zeus and Athena and, and Apollo and these very, but lots of gods you've never even heard of uh, who are all involved uh, in your life. For ancient people to say that there's only one God seemed ridiculous. I mean, Jew, they made fun of Jews for this. I mean, are you kidding me? you got one God? <laughs> it's like saying, you know, you have like, you know, one family member, you've got one neighbor, you've got one friend. Why would you want one? You know, don't you want more than one friend? No, no, I just, we insist on one. What, are you crazy? Uh, so, I mean, mo most people thought it was nonsense to say there's only one God or nonsense to say there's only one God. They were polytheists. They didn't have doctrines because religion was not about having faith as it is, as it developed in Christianity. Faith had nothing to do with it. It was all about cultic acts. Cultic acts. By the word cultic, and again, in English, cult has a negative connotation. It seems to suggest a small group of people who do crazy things and led by some wacko who makes them drink the Kool-Aid kind of thing. And that isn't what it means in ancient world. The, the word cult actually means care of the care of some. So we have agriculture, right? The care of the fields. And uh, the care of the gods was called the cultus deorum, the care of the gods. The cultic act is something that you do to take care of the gods. And there are basically two things that you do. Uh, you pray, where you, you thank God for what God has done. You ask one of the gods, all the gods. You, you ask uh, for help for something. You give praise for their greatness. You, you interact with the gods through your prayers, and you give them offerings. You give them offerings. The gods want some stuff, and actually they don't want much. They want to be respected and revered, and they want you to acknowledge them. And so sometimes the city will put on a big festival and they, they'll have a bull and they'll sacrifice the bull and they'll sacrifice it to, to Zeus or to Apollo or Athena or whoever the local god is and they'll, they'll uh, skin the bull and they'll, they'll burn the skin and the bones to the god. The god's happy getting all that stuff. And then they'll slaughter, they'll, they'll eat the meat. There'll be a big festival. There'll be a big party. And so that's that's. That's the cultic act where you're honoring the God and you're having a, a, a festival together, a feast together. But it doesn't take a big bowl for the city. Every, 
there are all sorts of offerings you can do. You can do private offerings with, uh, with an animal. You go to the temple, the priest will sacrifice the animal, but it doesn't even have to be that big. It'd be, if you're having a meal, you just pour out a little wine on the hearth in, in honor of the God, or you take a, take a few grains of the, uh, the, uh, the, of the bread you're eating, throw it on the fire as an offering to the God. And so you're offering things to God, and the gods like that. Uh, why is it important to do? It has nothing to do with the afterlife. It has to do with the present life. Life in the ancient world for 99.99% of the human race was really hard, as you know. No modern medicine. Uh, if you get sick, you know, you can come up with these folk remedies, but basically you're going to be sick. Uh, if you're... Uh, you know, if, if your uh, daughter gets a fever, you, there's nothing you can do to control it. If you have a, in the ancient world, if you have a tooth abscess, it's probably going to kill you. No antibiotics. Uh, the um, childbirth. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of women die in childbirth. Uh, and lots of babies die uh, at birth. In the Roman Empire, every woman of childbearing age had to have an average of six babies to keep the population constant. Uh, okay, so uh, people, people know that if it doesn't rain, they're going to starve to death next year. And the thing, you can't control any of these. You can't control infections. You can't control childbirth. You can't control the rain. You can't control the crops or the livestock or whether the neighboring village is more powerful than you is going to wipe you out. I and mean, you can't control things. But the gods can. The gods are more powerful than us. And there are gods for everything. And so we revere the gods and worship them through our cultic acts so that they help us because we are in desperate need of help simply to survive. And so it's not about the afterlife. It's about the present. Uh, it's about the present life. Okay, so that is the, uh, that's the, those are the people that Christians are preaching to. Uh, people who have those kind of beliefs and practices that have been going on for, for thousands of years. Uh, and Christians come up with something very different. The Christian message uh, was in many ways like the other religions. I mean, Christians also believed in, uh, in uh, prayer, and they believed in an offering. Christ made the ultimate sacrifice uh, to God. They believe that God was powerful and could help them in the present life. And so there, there are things that are, um, that are common. And you, yes, Christians are monotheists, but they have other supernatural powers. There are other divine powers. There are angels and archangels and principalities and powers. There's the devil. There are the demons. There, there, there are these other supernatural powers. So it's not a completely foreign thing. But there are certain things that made Christianity stand out in the ancient world. Christianity, like the Jews, said there's only one God to be worshipped. These other beings, the angels, the archangels, you're not supposed to worship them. Uh, you worship the one God. Jesus is his son. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus died for the sins of the world, and the way you have salvation is by having faith. It's not uh, what, what makes God happy is not making offerings to him. And of course, it's good to pray to him, but the way you have salvation is by believing that Jesus' death will bring your salvation, his death and resurrection. So it's about faith, not about cultic acts. And one reason for needing salvation is that there is an afterlife. Christians insisted, began insisting, that there is a heaven and a hell. And if you don't believe and practice a Christian life, you are going to hell. It doesn't matter if you're a good pagan. It doesn't matter if you're moral. It doesn't matter if you give your money away in order to help other people or if you go out of your way to help those in need. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. If you don't have faith in Christ, sorry, you're going to roast in hell forever. This was the Christian, uh, Christian message that made it very different from the other religions of the empire. And so uh, my question is, why did it succeed? 
why would anyone give up what they all what what their parents thought and did and what their grandparents their great grandparents and going back for thousands of years why would they give all that up in order to adopt this very strange new religion that's the question uh, and so, uh, it's going to take me basically two lectures to give the explanation to this, as I see it. Uh, uh, so, what made Christianity attractive? As I've been trying to argue, the pagan religions were all about the power of the gods to provide us with things that we need that we, don't, we can't provide for ourselves. In order for Christians to convince somebody to give up their gods, however many they've got, in order to worship the Christian God, the only way they could have, could have an effective message was by declaring that their God was more powerful than the other gods. See what I'm saying? You've got to make common ground because the reason they're religious in the first place is because the gods are powerful. Well, my God is more powerful. Well, if your God's more powerful, I want to worship that God. Well, to do that, you've got to give up your old gods. I don't want to give up my old gods. Well, you've got to choose. Do you want the one who's powerful or the one that's not very powerful? I want the one powerful. Become a Christian. Okay, that's, that's the basic line. How do you show that God is powerful? Well, the way ancient people showed it is the way modern people show it. God has done miracles. God has done miracles. Miracles are manifestations of divine power. Um, Jesus is raised from the dead because the power of God defeated death and brought him back to life. God has the power over illness. He can heal the sick. God has power over the demons. He can, he can cast out demons. God has, the power, God has power to do anything if you worship him. And you see that he's powerful because of the miracles he does. And so as it turns out, this is the principal reason people convert in the ancient world. This seems kind of weird to us today again. All, this whole lecture seems kind of weird in a way. But, but the reason people uh, convert in ancient is because they became convinced of God's miracles. I, I spent some years reading every account I could find in the first four or five hundred years of Christianity that explained why people converted. And people have People today have all sorts of explanations. I'm going to give some more explanations in the next lecture. But the one thing that is consistently stated in our sources, it's when people saw miracles, they converted. This starts with the New Testament. The first account we have of the spread of Christianity through the Roman world occurs in the book of Acts in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, you get your Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you get the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about the, the, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts is about what happens next. The apostles start spreading their faith in Jesus. And how do they spread it? They spread it by miracles. So it starts off, the first converts, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. So Jesus has, uh, has been raised from the dead. He's ascended to heaven. He says to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until the power of the Most High comes upon you. And so the disciples go to Jer They're in Jerusalem. They're there. They're, uh, there are a bunch of them there at this time. Uh, it's 50 days after Jesus' death. And so they've had some converts. And they're there. And the day of Pentecost comes. It's a Jewish festival. Um, and they're together and the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven and alights on each one of them. There's a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and each one of them has a tongue of flame over his head. And then, remarkably, uh, they, go, they go outside, and people start gathering around, wondering what's going on, Jews who have come for the festival, and these people, Christians start speaking foreign languages that they don't know. The Spirit is empowering them to preach in foreign languages, and they're the languages of the people who have come from around the world to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. It's their home languages. And people are saying, how do they know? What? How? how? And they're hearing the gospel preached. So the people gathered around are saying, these people are nuts. They're drunk. 
And uh, Peter says, no, no, we're not drunk. He said, it's only the third hour. It's only nine in the morning. We don't drink till 10. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 we're not drunk. This is the Holy Spirit. The power of God has come upon us. And, uh, and this is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Paul, Peter preaches a sermon based on this miraculous event. And we're told in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people converted on the spot. Boom! Just like that. Seeing a miracle. Two chapters later, second miracle in the book of Acts. Peter and the apostle John are walking by the temple uh, in Jerusalem, and there's a beggar in front who is paralyzed. He can't walk. He's asking for money. He looks at Peter and asks him for money. Peter says, I don't have any gold or silver, but what I have I will give to you. Uh, and he heals him. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say, stand up and walk. And his paralysis leaves him. He stands up. He starts walking. He starts jumping. He's, out of, he's going out of his mind. He's saying, oh, my God, I'm well. And people gather around, and there's a huge crowd. And, pe and people are saying, how did that happen? And Peter explains, the power of God. Jesus' power healed this person. Jesus is the one whose God power raised from the dead. Peter gives a sermon, and 5,000 more people convert. So in two chapters, we have 8,000 conversions. At this rate, the Roman Empire will be uh, Christian in about two months. <laughs> so it's all about seeing, seeing God's power that converts people. This isn't just the New Testament book of Acts. We have other narrative accounts of apostles in early Christianity who are doing amazing miracles. These other accounts are in books that are called apocryphal books. They're not in the New Testament. There are other books, and we have books that, that claim to tell the stories of the apostles as they spread Christianity throughout the world. Uh, and so we have, a, we have an Acts of Paul, an Acts of Thomas, uh, an Acts of Andrew. Uh, so these are all interesting books. One of my favorites of these is the, the, uh, is the Acts of Peter. The Acts of Peter is the account that shows how it is that Peter ended up in Rome to become the first pope. Uh, he goes to Rome because he's heard that in, this, in the story, he's heard that there is a false teacher there, a heretic, who's claiming that he represents the power of God. And Peter is told by God to go to Rome in order to confront this false teacher named Simon Magus. He's to confront Simon Magus to show that, in fact, he doesn't represent the true God. Peter represents the true God. And so Peter goes to Rome. Uh, Simon Magus knows that he's coming. He's been warned. And so Simon is holed up in a house with a very wealthy aristocrat. And uh, they set a guard at the door, and they won't let Peter in. Uh, and so there's a crowd expecting a confrontation, seeing Peter's now sh shown up. There's going to be a confrontation between him and Simon Magus. We'll see which one is more powerful. Simon, you know, Peter can't get in. And so he, uh, he sees there's a dog chained to a fence over here. So he unchains the dog, and he tells the dog to go in and tell Simon Magus that Peter has arrived. And the dog starts speaking with a human voice. The dog goes in. And tell Simon Magus, Peter's here now, and he's not in a good mood. Uh, you, better go, you better go talk to him. And, uh, the, uh, and then the dog comes back outside and says to Peter, okay, I did it. Uh, he's, he's, he's coming out. And then the dog do die, falls down and dies because he's, he's fulfilled his life mission now. And he dies. And when the crowd sees the dog speaking in a uh, human voice, they all convert and realize that Peter is the one who has the power of God. Uh, some people aren't convinced. And so Peter's talking to the crowd, and there's a, uh, they're, they're by a body of water, and there's a fishmonger shop behind him. And he's trying to convert, convince these people by his preaching, but nobody's buying it because he's just preaching. He's not showing any power. So, so he says, look, uh, okay, you're, you're having trouble accepting this, but what, there's, a, there's a dead tuna here in the, hanging on a hook in the window. If I take this smoked tuna and make it come back to life. Will you believe then? Oh, yes, Peter, then we would believe. So Peter goes over and pulls off the tuna off and throws it in the water and commands it to come back to life, comes back to life, starts swimming around. People are feeding it bread, and the, the whole crowd converts because it's, you know, Jesus and the, I mean, Peter and the smoked tuna story. So, so it, it kind of goes, goes like this throughout this entire book. And 
they end up being contests between Peter and Simon Magus. The, 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 in some ways, the most humorous one comes at the end. Simon Magus is trying to convince people that he represents the power of God rather than, and so he, he, he tells his followers, he says, I'm going to prove it, Simon Magus says, I'm going to prove that I have the power of God because tomorrow morning you all get, come, bring all the crowds, and I'm going to take off and I'm going to fly over the temples and hills of Rome. And uh, Peter's people hear that this is going to happen. They say, oh, Peter, Simon Magus is going to fly. He's, they're going to convince everybody. And Peter says, don't worry. And so they all come. Peter comes. Everybody else comes. Huge crowds. And Simon Magus, true to his word, takes off and starts flying. Peter, not to be outdone, deprives Simon Magus of the power of flight in midair. So he crashes to the ground breaks his leg in four places, and the people realize that he's the false prophet, and so they come together and they stone him to death, and then Peter now has won the the miracle contest. So, all right, so you get all of these miracles, and that's what's converting people. Uh, And it's not just in these legendary tales of the apostles. We have a count of a count of a count of Christians saying that we do better miracles than the pagans do. Of course, they can do some things, but ours are better, and that's why people are converting. That leads to a very obvious question for many of us. What's going on there? I mean, do you really think that Peter brought a tuna fish back to life? No, I don't think that. Me, I'm just talking about me. I'm not talking about you. You you might think he did, but I don't. Uh, So... How can I say that miracles are converting people if I don't think they did the miracles? I don't think any of these legendary miracles happened myself. I mean, my, my personal views, none of these miracles happened any more than I believe that, that Oral Roberts was really healing people. I don't believe it. I don't, I mean, some of you do. I, I, I don't. Uh, so my view as a historian is that it doesn't matter whether you think they happened or not. This is, kind of, this is going to be my key point. It doesn't matter whether you think they happened, and it doesn't matter whether they really did happen. Today, the vast majority of people, uh, say, in the South, mo- virtually the vast majority of Christians in the South believe in miracles. They believe miracles continue to happen. And the vast majority of those people who believe that have never actually seen one. Now, I know at coffee, five of you are going to come up and tell me about the ones you've seen. I, I, I know that. I've seen them too. I, I, I've been there. Uh, most people believe, though, not because they've actually seen it, but because they've heard about it. And the ones who've seen it, by the way, are almost ones who have heard about it before. What matters to convince people is not whether the miracles happen. It's whether they're talked about as having happened. Most Christians today would say, yes, of course the Spirit came upon the Christians on the day of Pentecost and they spoke in tongues. Of course it happened. Did they see it? No, they heard about it. People today have heard about the miracles of Jesus. They've heard about the resurrection of Jesus. They've heard about the miracle of the apostles. They've heard about the miracles of of, of They've heard about miracles happening. Their cousin had a next-door neighbor who, and they've heard the story, and they believe it. Um, And so, uh, and I regularly have people come up to me with written documentation. that You know, it's been scientifically proven, but it's always something that they heard from someone else. Not always. Sometimes, I mean, often, of course, I know lots of people who say they've seen the miracles. My point is that hearing miracles can be as effective as seeing a miracle or, even better, experiencing a miracle. So there are other miraculous themes in early Christianity that contribute to this, but my, my main, I'm going to talk about it just very briefly, but my main point is that uh, I do think that miracles are what are converting people to Christianity. And the logic of it is that if you're worshiping the gods for power and the Christian God is more powerful then you should worship that God. A lot of these miracles, by the way, have to do with miracles over the other gods. And so in the Acts of John, for example, uh, the Apostle John goes into the city of Ephesus where, uh, where Artemis 
is the goddess of the city. And they all worship Artemis, and there's this huge temple to Artemis. And John, the, the disciple of Christ, goes into this temple of Artemis, and, uh, and he, uh, he preaches, and there's a big crowd around, and nobody's kind of buying it. And then he says, okay, I'm going to destroy this temple through the power of God. And then people start taking him seriously. They say, no, no, John, don't do it. And John curses the temple, and the, uh, all the statues to the gods fall down and turn into dust. The temple roof caves in and kills the local priest. And then they realize that John's God is more powerful than Artemis. And so they all convert. And as a nice little uh, uh, end of that story is that uh, John then raises the priest of Artemis from the dead, and he converts. <laughs> so it's a nice rounded story. Well, so so this is showing that the uh, that that th- it's the Christian miracles that are doing it. There are other there are other miraculous things that you might not think of as um, as miraculous, but I think that they probably are. One is that um, Christians had the reputation for being willing to going to go to their death for their faith, and to bear up under suffering without even complaining about it. We have these accounts that go back to the second century of people being flogged within an inch of their lives, so there's just the bones left on their back, and they don't even moan or groan. Uh, People being tortured to death and not crying out because God is comforting them. And these stories say that when the outsiders would see this, they would convince people their God is comforting them in ways that our gods don't. Their God is more powerful. So the amazing martyrs, the stories of the amazing martyrs. And again, back to the afterlife. When Christians taught that their God was powerful, they didn't mean just in this life. They meant that his power is going to extend beyond this life. The power of God is manifest in the afterlife. He has the power to give you paradise forever. You'll be in pleasant gardens with loved ones, with sweet smells and fruit-bearing trees. You'll always have enough to eat, and you'll sit and you'll talk and converse with each other. It'll be like that for eternity. It'll be fantastic. Or if you're not on God's side, you can roast in the flames for eternity because God can do both. And it's up to you which you want. Do you want the flames or do you want the paradise? Uh, Well, uh, it's a miracle that God can do that, but God can do it because he's all-powerful. In sum, miraculous conversions. uh, My contention, this is, uh, I always have trouble convincing people of this, but I think it's right. I think in the early church, the way they convinced people was by doing their miracles. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to do uh, questions and answers. I wonder if we should turn on the lights. So, uh, yeah, we can do that. To wake up a few people. And There we go. Hello. Good morning. We've, we've uh, got a microphone over here in this corner. And Tom, you want to come over here? This one. Uh, and they'll pass it to you. If you would, please wait till you get to the mic because we're, we record all of these. And some of the questions and answers uh, really are a significant part of the program. Uh, before we do that, let me just, for those of you who had a question about Greta Vospers, who were here for that lecture here last year, Greta prevailed in her suit with the United Church of Canada, and they finally gave up and they dropped it. So she's off the hook and doing well, okay? Uh, when we leave to go in uh, for lunch, which right after the Q&A, that's what we'll be doing, uh, there'll be a walkway, it's about a five-minute, four-minute walk over to the cafeteria. For those of you who have some mobility issues, we do have a shuttle service that will also be running back over there. So uh, at the end of the service, you can follow the herd, or you can kind of step out here to the side door and get the shuttle. Okay? Right. Questions? Yes. There are questions. Could you get the mic to some the second person while the first person is talking? So if you've got a... No, it won't work. Uh, does someone else raise your hand if you want to be the second questioner so that uh, we can get a mic to you while this person... Yeah, okay, good. 
I'm I'm not a uh, uh, biblical or Christian historian, but it, I, I seem to recall that uh, talking about the apocryphal acts that there was some papal convention that decided what books would actually go in the New Testament and which weren't, uh, and and I'm wondering how uh, those decisions were made and what apocryphal acts, books of acts should maybe really be in the New Testament and which are really just yeah. fi- fiction. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's kind of a complicated question, but I'll... Um, so, yeah, the question is, in, in the New Testament, we have, we have 27 books, uh, the four Gospels and the Book of Acts and Letters of Paul, etc. And the question is, when, when, did, we, you know, when did we get that and, and why and why not some of the others? And um, the first thing I'll say about that is that the common belief about that in the American population today is generally wrong. And uh, the reason it's wrong is because most people uh, base their views on that inestimable authority Dan Brown. Uh, Because in the Da Vinci Code, what Dan Brown says is that the books of the New Testament were decided at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, which is the same time where they decided that Jesus would be the Son of God based on a very close vote. (laughs) Completely wrong. Uh, the Council of Nicaea has nothing to do with which books got into the New Testament. They didn't talk about it at the Council of Nicaea. They didn't decide about it at the Council of Nicaea. It has nothing to do with the Council of Nicaea. Uh, I'll, I might say a few things about the Council of Nicaea in a later lecture. Uh, the Council of Nicaea was in the year 325, and it was a council of, worldwide council of bishops. It was called by the Emperor Constantine after he had converted. Um, so that has nothing to do with it. So... Um, what does have to do with it? So the deal is there were lots of different books floating around in early Christianity, uh, most of them claiming to be by apostles. And so we have other gospels. We have the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip, uh, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of... It's, I mean, we have all these, these, these gospels. And we have other acts, as I was mentioning. We have letters, some claiming to be written by Paul, some not. I mean, we have all these things. And so... Um, the very short story is that when you start getting lots of books and you have different Christian communities that are that have different views of things, sometimes wildly different views, and they're basing it on the books of Scripture they have, then it matters what their books of Scripture are. And so you've got to figure out a way of deciding which are the legitimate books of Scripture. And so Christians had these debates. Um, and so, some groups said, well, these Gospels are, should be in, or those Gospels, or these. And so people had these various views. Um, the short story is that church leaders developed certain theological views that they were not willing to compromise on. Uh, think Theresa May. Uh, um, so... Um, and so these are, their, these are their views, and some books teach these things or at least allow for these things and others not. So they developed various ways of coming up with various criteria. Uh, a, a book had to be go back to an apostle, their view. A, a book had to be uh, widely used in the church. It couldn't be just like a local favorite. It had to be widely used. And a book had to be orthodox. It had to like toe the line in terms of the right doctrine. And so they debated these things on and on and on. And, by, by about maybe 150 years after Jesus' death, lots of churches had most of the books that we might think of as the Bible. They had like most of the letters of Paul and the Gospels, for example. Um, the, the issues continued to be argued for a long time. The first time any author of record listed our 27 books, and only our 27 books, was a, a man named Athanasius, who uh, in, in the year 367... Uh, wrote a letter. He was a bishop of the city of Alexandria in Egypt, a very powerful city. He's a very powerful bishop. He wrote a letter to his uh, to his entire all the people under his under under his authority. Indicate it was an, an annual letter that he sent to all of his churches. And in this letter, among other things, he listed our twenty seven books and he said these are the twenty seven, no others. Um, that didn't solve the issue. People continue to debate for decades, even centuries, about this book or that book, but that's the beginning. And so, it, but it's based on these various criteria. So nobody really thought any of these legendary acts should be in. 
because I think most people just realize these are like, they're really great stories, but this is not scripture. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning. On behalf of everyone here, we appreciate you being here. We thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, in uh, other times and places and other books, in fact, I think the one that we're focusing on this morning, you self-describe as a agnostic atheist, and you've uh, uh, explained how that's uh, true. Uh, but you also happen to be a very uh, capable and passionate and effective uh, biblical scholar. So I really have a two-part question, and maybe you could answer at least one, if not both parts. Uh, the, f the first part is, I would just uh, be curious to hear what your response is. Uh, if the Bible is not uh, a personal book of faith uh, for you personally, it doesn't bound everything that, that, uh, that you think, uh, how does that affect or not affect uh, your biblical scholarship or your approach to biblical scholarship and time permitting B, I would be curious to your answer to the Marcus Borg question. Uh, tell us about the God that you do not believe in. <laughs> okay. I think I can do both of those. Uh, how, how does my uh, being an agnostic atheist affect the fact that I'm a biblical scholar? How does it actually affect my scholarship on the Bible? I think the answer to that one is it has no effect whatsoever to people's surprise. But the reason I say that, I think I can document that, is because the views I have about the Bible now are exactly the views I had when I was a faithful church person. Um, they're not the views I had when I was a fundamentalist Christian. And, you know, in the South especially, it's really hard for people to get their mind around the idea that you can be a a Christian without believing in the Bible, without believing the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. If you don't believe that, you can't be a Christian. Well, but who gave them the right to define what Christian is? And the reality is that throughout the history of the Christian church, the vast majority of Christians did not have a view of the inerrancy of the Bible. That's a modern belief that started at the end of the 19th century, especially in America, and it's swept through the South, so now people think it's common sense. Uh, in fact, for most people throughout history, that, that is not what Christianity is at all. Uh, my, my views of biblical scholarship were, uh, I started acquiring them when I was training to be a minister at Princeton Theological Seminary, which is a Presbyterian Theological seminary. Of course, you know a lot of my students don't think those Presbyterians are really Christian. But, but, but you know, I mean, uh, so uh, so my views, most of my views have not changed uh, much at all since since I became an agnostic atheist. Um, what God do I not believe in? Uh, it's a good question, and my answer is I don't believe in any of the gods. So I mean, I don't if. If you're defining, of course, it depends how you're defining God, which is kind of the question. I mean, Mark Sports, well, how are you defining God? And I'm defining it in a very broad sense. I'm defining it in the sense of some kind of um, superhuman force um, that is sort of beyond nature in the universe. Um, if you say, well, nature is God. Okay, that's fine. You can define it that way, and I believe in nature. And, but I'm a complete materialist. I, I think that I'm, I'm a complete materialist. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I agree with scientific assumptions about the material world and everything in it. Yes. Then, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so because the early Jesus movement w remained a Jewish sect and that Rome allowed um, <laughs> Jews to be exempt from the requirement to offer sacrifices by offering a sacrifice to their God in the temple. Um, how plausible do you think that uh, Paul received the beatings in the synagogue from the Jewish authorities because he was trying to, he was telling Gentiles to stop sacrificing to their gods? Like, because it seemed like a growing Jewish movement. He didn't, like, could the authorities think that they didn't want to see him as a representative of them so they could, like, get away from this exemption? Yeah. Um, first thing is, I don't think they were, I, I think it's true that Paul was punished in the synagogues. But I don't think it was because he's telling pagans to stop sacrificing. I think that had nothing to do with it. Um, Paul was declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, that, I think, is what got him in trouble with other Jews. Uh, 
So it's kind of, again, it's a long story, but today when people think, you know, what is the Messiah? My, my students at Chapel Hill, if you say, well, what does the word Messiah mean? They usually say something like, well, it means God. He's like he's a God man. He's a man who's a God. And that, that is not at all what anybody in the ancient world thought the Messiah was. Um, uh, the word Messiah, okay, it's a long story. I could do a whole lecture on this, which you absolutely don't want me to do. So uh, um, um, in, in the first century, in, in Paul's time, the people, most Jews didn't believe in a coming Messiah, just like today. I mean, most Jews don't sit around thinking the Messiah is going to come. It's not what they're thinking about. Um, most Jews in the Paul's world probably didn't either. Those who did think in a Messiah, though, based it on traditions that said that God was going to save somebody to deliver us from our oppression. It might be a warrior king like David, the son of David, a, a warrior king who drives out the enemy and sets up Jerusalem as a, as a sovereign state. It might be a divine figure who comes from heaven to destroy God's enemies. There's, there's some figure God's going to send that is a powerful figure that's going to wipe out the enemy and establish Israel as his people. Uh, various expectations of what this would be, but they all had in common the idea that it would be a figure of grandeur and power who would destroy the enemy. Paul was declaring that Jesus was the Messiah. Who was Jesus? Jesus was a crucified criminal. He didn't destroy the enemy. He was squashed by the enemy, unceremoniously tortured to death in public. That's the Messiah? What, are you crazy? And so, uh, so I used to, you know, years ago, I used to tell my students that the reaction most Jews would have to this idea that Jesus is the Messiah is the reaction most of us would have had uh, back in the 90s if I told you that I think David Koresh is the Lord of the universe. David Koresh, the guy at Waco who was stockpiling arms and the FBI went in and there was a big fire and they all got killed and all that stuff with the kids and sex. What? He's, yes, he's the Lord of the universe. Are you nuts? And so now, so I, I had to stop giving that illustration, not only because now my students don't know who David Koresh was, but, but also because, uh, because at the end of the semester every year, I'd get these course evaluations that have four or five students say, I can't believe that Ehrman thinks that David Koresh is the Lord of the universe. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm not saying that I think, you, I'm saying that the kind of gut reaction we have to that is the gut reaction of most, and so Jew, most Jews thought that this was, uh, an absolutely offensive message, and that's why they persecuted Christians early on. And I think that's why Paul was beaten up in the synagogues. And it's not implausible that Paul was beaten up because he says that he himself, before he became a Christian, was out trying to destroy the church. I think he's probably taking people out and beating them up himself before he became a Christian. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, who has it? Who has a microphone? Oh, Suzanne, give, give the next one the microphone. Yeah. Somebody else raise your hand. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. It's my understanding that the two earliest groups of people to um, convert to Christianity were women and slaves. Assuming that's true, does that integrate with your lecture uh, in terms of them, those two groups, being more willing to believe in miracles? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, <sighs> So um, the, the question is rooted in kind of this broader view that people have that, that I think is basically right, that Christianity initially appealed mostly to people who were the lower classes and were underprivileged, uh, and women and, and slaves would be in that group. Um, I, I personally agree that probably the earliest converts were among the lower classes. Um, I don't think that we have very good evidence that the majority of the early converts were women and children. Uh, they may have been, but we don't have we don't have any evidence of that. That's not what that's not found in the Book of Acts, for example, and it's not. So I mean, so and Paul doesn't say anything about that. When Paul greets people in his churches, he tends to greet men, uh, and they they appear to be free men, most of them. So I'm not sure that it's slaves and women, but I think the basic principle is probably right that. Uh, Christianity was appealing to uh, people who were who tended to be oppressed for one reason or another because and, and the power of God fits in as you're saying it fits in perfectly well with my lecture because people who are oppressed need somebody to help them and the oppressed need it more than the people are doing well and so a God who's powerful is the one who can help them uh, and so 
Um, there are big debates among scholars about the constituency of the earliest Christian churches. Um, and the, the view that was around for a long time that I still kind of subscribe to was, was that the earliest churches, <clears throat> the first hundred years or so, really were mainly lower class people. Um, the way to kind of temper that response, though, is to point out that virtually everybody in the ancient world was a lower class person. Right. In other words, they. So this this seems odd to us. Again, one more thing that seems odd to us in the in the Roman world, there wasn't a middle class uh, to speak of. There wasn't a middle class. Like you know, today we think of most of you know people middle class. They didn't have that. You had the very wealthy, extremely wealthy, and you know less wealthy and less wealthy, but wealthy. And then you had most people, not over 90, 90, 93, 95 percent people were poor, like you know living on the edge, poor. Uh, and some are, you know, they're, they're gradations within all that. So Christians basically were drawing from the population. So we don't start getting aristocrats converting for, you know, probably until the third century for the most part. Um, so I wouldn't say most were slaves and women, but I would say most were oppressed, but that's because of the population. The reason some scholars have started doubting that is because of something the Apostle Paul says. In, in Paul's letter to Corinthians, Paul says in chapter 1, he points out not many of you were, uh, are, uh, are well born or, or uh, well-placed, or wise, in other words, highly educated. And scholars would point out, well, if he says not many of you are of that class, and some of you are. And so there might have been a kind of a cross, you know, there might have been some aristocrats, but we don't have very good evidence of it. So. Yes, yes. <clears throat> the, <laughs> the response that many of us might uh, come up with uh, Hearing your uh, scholarly undermining of many of the traditions of the early church as carried forward to this generation uh, is the concept of faith, that faith is a gift and that it is given to us and those who are most fortunate to have the gift of faith do not need to know on a scientific proof that miracles happen. They believe in God and in the teachings of Christianity, for example, because it is inherent in them through this gift. Would you comment on uh, the origin of the concept of faith that I've just described? Yeah, I, uh, I really don't think I was trying to undermine any any Christian faith at all. I think uh, it'd be perfectly possible to agree with everything I've said, except for the fact that I don't believe in these miracles myself. Uh, if you're a Christian, you simply say the miracles happen. Uh, and, you know, the way you're describing it, it'd be because you've got, you've got faith. Um, the precise way you're talking about faith um, as a gift that allows you, uh, from God, that allows you to believe things I would say that that's not the view of the New Testament, even though it is a common view today. Um, and you see that common view not just among um, people who are theologically sophisticated, although some people do, you know, a lot of sophisticated theologians have that idea that faith is a gift. Uh, you know, it obviously can't be earned. It's not because of something you deserve. It's just it's a free gift of God. Um, uh, but a lot of people have that idea. When I was growing up, you probably all had the same thing, where uh, my dad would always just say, well, you just got to have faith, right? It's like, like it's this thing that you have or you don't have, and you have to have it. And, uh, and I would always ask him, i say, well, faith in what? <laughs> and it's like there wasn't any content, right? It was just like this thing that you have, faith. And you either have it or you don't have it. And my view is always that, well, you know, faith, mean, faith is belief, and belief is in something, right? So it just isn't a, like a, so anyway. Uh, I, um, I would not object to Christians who say, uh, I know miracles happen. I'm not interested in scientific proof or historical evidence. I just know they happen. And that's, that's perfectly fine with me. I mean, I, I, I don't have that view. Um, but there's no the, the nice thing about the view is there's no arguing against it. Right? I mean, how would you possibly argue against it? Because okay, that's yeah, your view. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned during your lecture that you 
when you're talking about miracles and how it doesn't really matter whether or not they actually happen. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, guys. That's um, okay. Anyway, you mentioned that in your lecture, it doesn't really matter whether or not miracles actually happen, but that you personally don't believe that they did. Yeah. Um, just that it matters that people heard about it. How do you think that people heard about it if it didn't actually like happen? Okay, great question. And when I say it didn't matter, I don't mean it didn't matter. I don't mean it doesn't matter in the religious sense. I mean, historically, for why people converted, it doesn't matter. My view is that everybody on the planet agrees that there are stories about miracles that didn't happen. So in the South, um, you know, people say, well, look, the miracles of the New Testament must have happened because they're reported. These same people would say the miracles that Muhammad did that the Muslims talk about absolutely did not happen. You know, or the miracle of Joseph Smith and the 12 golden tablets, you know, and the angel Moroni appearing to him, that didn't happen. So, but there are millions of people who believe it did happen and they tell the stories about it. And so I think it's very easy to tell stories about miracles that didn't happen because it hap that happens all the time. And so I don't think that there has to be a fire where there's smoke. I think that, in fact, um, especially in the ancient world, in the ancient world, the ancient world had a very different view of miracles from our view. In our view, a miracle involves a suspension of natural law, right? We have this idea of natural law in our head. So that, for example, uh, the, um, the law of... Uh, the, the law of gravity means that if I step off the stage, you know, I'm not going to float up. I'm going to come down, and it's going to be true for all of us. A miracle would be if I stepped off the stage and I just went that, you know, that would be a miracle because it would be a violation of, of natural law. If I try to walk on lukewarm water in a lake, I'm going to sink because my body weighs more than the water it displaces, and so I will sink. And, and if I can walk on water, that would be a miracle. And so you come up with all the... And so we think in terms of violation of natural law, but the ancient world didn't have natural law. They didn't think about natural law the way we do. This is a post-enlightenment idea that there are actually laws that are governing nature. For most ancient people, God governs the gods govern nature. So the gods make everything happen. Why does the sun come up in the morning? The gods make it happen. Why does it rain? The gods make it happen. It's no more miracle to walk on water than for it to rain. You know, it's no more miracle to be raised from the dead than for the sun to come up. It's just, it's, it's just one more thing God's doing. So the question is not, for them, is it a violation of natural law? For them, the question is, who's doing it? You know, is he doing it, and, what, and who, who's the one responsible? And so they have a very different mindset. And so they had no trouble coming up with stories about miracles because miracles are happening all the time, in my view. Yeah. Yes? Professor, going on the question of miracles, do you have any sense of how many of these stories about miracles just were fabricated out of whole cloth as opposed to being based upon some sort of observation of some sort of event? And the second one is, if there was an observation of some sort of event, what was happening there? Yeah, I, and I'm not. And I, I don't want to. I, it's on. I think you just need to put it closer yeah, to you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not getting to the question of whether the miracle, act, a miracle, yeah, yeah. actually no, I got happened. It. Yeah. Just what? What do you think was people were actually observing at the time of those yeah. events? Right. So um, there, uh, in the 19th century, there was a school of New Testament scholarship that was convinced. Uh, a, that miracles did not happen at all. There were no such things as miracles. These were post-enlightenment scholars in Europe. There's no such thing as miracles in these people's view. But when the Gospels narrate miracles, they're narrating things that actually happened that were misunderstood to be miracles. Okay, this was a, a common way of interpreting the Bible back in the early 19th century. So it's by a group of people called rationalists because they could reason away anything. You know? and, so, and, so, and they had great explanations for things. And so there's a, there's a person in, um, in, the, uh, in the 1820s named Heinrich Pallas. He was a German theologian who wrote a book called Das Leben Jesu, the, the Life of Jesus. And he went through all the miracles of the Gospels and showed that in it, I mean, he tried to show, he showed that what was described as a miracle wasn't really a miracle. It was something that had happened that people misunderstood. 
And so, for example, um, just, just as an example, um, Jesus walking on the water, right? So Jesus has been teaching the crowds and the disciples uh, uh, come up to him and they talk to him and he, he tells them to dismiss the crowd and, and he tells them, you go to the other side of the lake in your boat and I'll, I'll meet you there. And so it, night falls and a storm comes up and they start rowing and they're, they're rowing and they're, this wind is against them and it's stormy and they're not getting there. And Jesus, after staying behind and praying for a while, looks up and sees that they're just still in the middle. And so he, start, he walks to them on the water uh, and they see him. And Peter, they're all, they're all stunned. They think it's a ghost. And, um, and Jesus says, no, it's not a ghost. It is I. Peter says, Lord, Peter's always saying these stupid things, right? Peter, Peter's, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. <laughs> okay, so, so P, Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. And then he starts looking around and realizing what he's doing. He starts to sink. And Jesus reaches out his hand and says, oh, you have little faith. And they climb in the boat and they get to the other side. Okay, so that's the story. In, it's, in, uh, it's, in, it's in the Gospels. The, the account I just gave you is the one found in Matthew. Um, and Pallas wants to know, Pallas is a man of the Enlightenment. He says, look, there, people do not walk on water. So uh, what really happened? Something happened to make them think that Jesus is walking on water. What happened was Jesus dismissed the crowds, told them to go to the other side of the boat. They start rowing. It's dark. Wind comes up. They're not making any progress. And they think they've made some progress. They think they're in the middle of the lake. In fact, they haven't gotten off the shore. And Jesus, uh, Jesus then realizes what's going on. He starts walking to them, wading through the water, and they're terrified. They're thinking, oh, there's somebody walking on the water. And Jesus says, no, it's just me. Well, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. Okay. And he gets out, and he thinks he's drowning. Some... Listen, so what's the problem here? They get in the boat, and they're on the shore. And so uh, they assume it's a miracle, right? Because they thought they were in the middle, but... In fact, it was just a misunderstanding. Pallas goes through every miracle of the New Testament and, and comes up with something like that, an explanation for how these people who lived before the Enlightenment misunderstood that something that happened was a miracle. They misunderstood it as a miracle when, in fact, it was just a natural event. So um, that view of scholarship was popular for a long time, and there's still people who subscribe to that. Most scholars don't really take that view anymore. And the reason is because for Pallas to make that argument, for any of these rationalists to make that kind of argument, what they have to do is change what the text says in order to explain what it means. Because the text doesn't say that they were by the shore. It says they were in the middle of the lake. And it doesn't say that he waded through the water. It says he walked on the water. And it doesn't say that Peter floundered first, and then Jesus brought him up. It says that he first was up, and then he floundered. And so you've got to change the whole thing around. And surely the best way to interpret a story is not by changing its words, right? The best way to interpret the story is to take its words for what it's saying and come up with some. And so I think most people think that a story like that actually, I don't know, they would, you know, most people are not going to say it was made up whole cloth, although there's certainly a lot of, a lot of people would say that, but most biblical scholars would say that this is a, an imaginative story that is trying to convey an important lesson. The lesson is who is able to rise above the, stormy, the storms of life? Life is like a, it's a storm at sea for most of us. I mean, there's wind and there's rain and there's thunder and it's big waves. And it's like we're trying to get through this thing. And it's like, and it's impossible. We're going to sink. We're going to drown. Is there anybody who can, who can rise above all of that? Jesus can rise above all of it. Jesus is the one who can walk on the water. And if you believe in him, he can he can help you walk on the water too. You can survive this life. Not only has he had the capability of walking on the water, he's God. God is the one who has power over the wind and the waves. And so, so Jesus is God who can help us. And so it's a story that's trying to illustrate a bigger point that somebody came up with, uh, but probably not because you know they, they had this kind of weird incident at night and didn't realize they weren't in the middle of the lake. Uh, right, do I have another question? Yes. Yes, uh, you talk about Pentecost, and I just wondered what what did you find to be the impact? Um, if you think about what was the motivation for the disciples and many others after them 
to go through death, certain death, um, and torture, and so forth. And, and of course, that, that impact on the spread of Christianity, yeah. if you comment on that. Yeah, I'm, I wasn't quite sure about the Pentecost connection, but I... Well, after Pentecost, you know, when, when they had Pentecost, they, they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit I see. and went out and spread the word. I got it, yeah. And why would they be willing to die for their faith if they... Exactly. Yeah, right. Um, well, a couple things to say about that. Uh, one thing is, I mean, I think that the disciples really believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. I mean, they, they really believed it. Uh, and so they were, if, if they died for their faith, it's because they actually had this faith. No, none of the, uh, there's no account of Pentecost outside of Acts chapter 2. And so we don't know that disciples died because they believed they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That, that's in no other story. That's just, just Acts chapter 2. The other thing I'll say, though, is that there's another modern uh, misconception about the apostles, which is, uh, I hear this all the time, uh, that um, Christianity must be true because the apostles would not be willing to die for a lie. And they were tortured to death, for all of them were martyred, and that they wouldn't do that if they knew it wasn't true. And the reality is, we don't know how these people died. Everybody says they were all martyred, and we don't have any records of that from the ancient church. What we have, in other from the early church, the only people we know about their death from the New Testament is um, the, uh, the, the, the clear statement that James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by Herod, but we're not told what the grounds were, we're not, and we're not told how it happened, or we don't know why it happened. There are hints that um, Peter is going to be killed, um, after that, within in the first century, we do have an indication from a non-canonical book that Peter and Paul were both uh, were both killed for their faith. Um, after that, our sources are these legendary apocryphal acts. Yeah, but Stephen wasn't one of the disciples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just talking about I was just talking about the disciples. Yeah. Um, so Stephen is martyred in, in the book of Acts. He's the first first Christian martyr. Yeah. So. Um, I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these people died for their faith, and I, but I think they really did have faith. But I don't think that it requires Pentecost, and I don't think that it requires uh, the, their belief to be true. I mean, there are, you know, lots and lots of people who die for false things. I mean, there, there are martyrs in lots of religions. So they, it's not, it doesn't make the religion true. It just means that it's believed wholeheartedly. There's one more question over here, way over here. One question. Then, then but I'll, I'll, I'll suggest, it's a follow-up to the question about women and slaves, yeah. and it actually may be a segue to the next lecture, and so maybe we need to go to lunch. But the question is, what about householder conversions, and, and doesn't the household sort of follow the leadership of the, of, of the, of the head of household? Yeah. And if that's leading into the next lecture, we'll just wait until after lunch. Well, no, let me say it now because I was de debating whether to include it in the next lecture or not, and I thought not. So let me say it now. <laughs> um, it is absolutely true that in the ancient world, the uh, head of the household, the pater familias in the uh, Roman world, uh, determined the religion of a family. And so the pater familias uh, had the household gods and made sure everybody worshipped the household gods and would, would control. So in Christianity, if a, uh, if a male leader of a household converted, necessarily his family, his wife and children and slaves would also convert. Now, some people say, well, that's not really a conversion for these other people because, like, they're just doing what this guy tells them to do. And, uh, of course, I mean, that, that's true in one, on one level. On another level, though, these people start going to church, and they start uh, praying every day to the God of Jesus, and they start doing, they, they get baptized, and they start following the Eucharist, and in a few years, they're probably, they're probably in with everyone else. And so uh, what it means, though, if you want to convert a large mass of people, you actually don't need to convert all eight of those people. You need to convert one of them. And that's going to matter for what I'm going to say later. So, all right, thank you very much. Okay.